what do y'all think this title says? Because every time I see it, it looks like it says you are not enough, but it's actually a double negative. This is Jody Hildebrand's book. And it really says you are not not enough. But every time I see it, I'm like, you're not enough. Okay, we're gonna flip the camera back because I hate the way this looks. Hi, new me, hello. So I told you guys that I've been having an interest in reading Jodi Hodebrand's book and because there was a form on Reddit that showed a portion of it that went into her background history. And knowing me, I'm a very nosy person. I want to know about Jodi Hodebrand's past. And this is the book that I got on Amazon that's available. And you know, upon first reaction of this, the cover looks really cheap. I don't know if she printed this out herself. I don't know if she had a publisher or something like that, but the cover looks really cheap. Like it's really desaturated. Her photo itself is actually really blurry. It looks like this was a printed version that was sold on Alibaba or Timu. I don't know, but I got this from Amazon. So I don't know why anyone would make counterfeits of Jodi Hildebrand's book, but maybe she just didn't really have the best printer to print this and paper, I guess. But we got the cover right here. And then when you look inside, my friend was really confused because she's like, what, what is this? Like, is this like a manual or something like that? I mean, I guess it could technically be a manual, but if you look in the inside, the font, I guess y'all can't really see, but like, what, what kind of font is that? Like, I don't know. It just looks really cheaply done. The paper itself is kind of like meh. But anyways, um, I am digressing right now, but I do want to give you guys my first reaction of this because, ah, ah, ah. okay, Jodi Hildebrand. So again, like I said, I am very nosy. I do want to know what happened in Jodi Hildebrand's past, but more importantly, I think it's kind of good to understand where people came from and what potentially they went through that made them who they are today. Although I don't think we're going to get much out of this one because this is going to be from her perspective and we're only going to hear about probably a lot of the good stuff that she thinks she did and had effect on other people. But um, she does talk about herself. She does talk about her family. She talks about growing up and I didn't realize, but she actually has two kids, which I think I maybe knew, but I forgot. I did hear that she was divorced, but yeah, this kind of confirms it all. So she was divorced for after like two years after getting married. Uh, she was a single mom for a little bit or maybe forever because I don't know if she ever got into another relationship. And she also has two young kids at the time when she was single. So I want to read you guys parts of the passage from chapter one. And honestly, this was a really hard read for me because I did say this about Becky Hill's book where similarly, this read kind of like a diary. Um, it was kind of like a diary slash like a manual how to guide, like how to do this, how to do that. But I feel like this book offered a lot of, I don't know, like I, I love reading, okay? If I can read old boring court documents, but they're not boring to me, if I can read a lot of like, you know, fiction stuff, I could read nonfiction stuff. I honestly love reading. I could read textbooks too, because things, I, I just think information just so interesting to me. I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I read this during my trip in Joshua Tree and I was like, whew, this is a, this is a, this is a hard read. You know, I was really trying to get into it. And usually what gets me interested into a book is when someone shares, especially if it's like a self-help book, right? Usually when they share their personal experiences, cause they're like, oh, okay, this is the lesson that they're trying to teach you. They're trying to tie it back to their personal experience. And then it's supposed to have like a profound effect on you. It's supposed to be poignant, but I, I don't know when I was kind of, I am just skimming through this, to be honest. Um, I skimmed through this and it's about, how many pages is this? It's not, even, it's not even that long. It's like 100, like 10 pages. It's not even that long. It's like a quick, easy read for me. I honestly ended up just skimming through it and just reading her personal experiences. And at some point, you know, if there was like a bulletin that interested me here and there, like when she would define distortion, when she would talk about love, when she would talk about relationships, I was like, okay, like I want to see what her perspective on this is. So... I want to read you guys portions of chapter one that goes into her childhood, uh, her traumas. And then we kind of want to skim through the book and talk about her relationships with other people and things that I thought were interesting. So this is kind of like a, I read Jodi Hildebrand's book, so you don't have to. And we are, you know, it's, it's a lot of the stuff is just like talks about distortion. It talks about loving God. It talks about connection and different definitions of connection. Um, I just didn't really care for those portions very much. I did try to read it. It's not like I just didn't want to read it. I did try to read it, but it was just kind of like, I don't know, to me, it was just like, kind of like nonsense. <laughs> so, into the return bed you go. Sorry, I was going to throw the book, but I don't want, I don't want to damage it. We're going to keep it in decent condition. All right, y'all. So before we get to chapter one, just to show you guys kind of like the preview of the entirety of this book. This is one lie of distortion is at the core of what is making God's children sick. 
I don't know if she has someone to proofread this, um, or maybe they weren't just like a professional, but it did read like a diary to me because there are some things are just written in all capitalizations because she want to put emphasis on it. But it's like, you don't, you don't need to do that. It felt like I was reading almost like an unhinged Facebook post from a 50 year old boomer, something that was proselytizing to their audience. Like I just felt like I was just being lectured at and now this part in chapter one, this is the part that was in the Reddit post that got me a little bit intrigued into reading this book. So I'm going to read it to you guys. I was born to six of seven children. My father was a military man who flew fighter planes and my mother was a stay at home mom. My parents had a very traditional roles for the time period and neither of my parents were available to be vulnerable about their personal experiences and pain that life inevitably, inevitably presented to them. The motto in our home growing up was, you're Hildebrand, go hard or go home. As a child, I quickly learned how to be a pleaser, a doer, a hard worker and obedient to a fault. I was always considered and willing to help, needing a little interaction to keep me satisfied. I also learned how to manipulate the attention I receive. I bought my parents' attention with the currency of my obedience. I did not know that my misguided obedience was inviting me to a world of no emotion, which then disconnected me from my vulnerability, my real life experiences, and physical and emotional safety. It was no one's fault really, rather the environmental and emotional outcomes of my own choices and the choices of those around me introduced me to a world of dishonesty. I didn't have any other life to compare it to, however, so I was at peace. By the time I was born, my mother had experienced the death of one of my brothers. Her four-month-old son died from an undiagnosed heart condition. He was there one minute and then gone the next. Oh, that's really sad. Though many people around her were interested in her grief and pain, she was not willing to disclose the devastation she felt. That tragedy alone, with many other painful experiences in my mother's life, resulted in her choosing a controlled and controlling exterior, which appeared to serve her well. Unfortunately, I was never able to know her as a woman or mother, and we both missed out on connection. My father was at my father was as emotionally shut down as my mother, yet he spent more time with me, teaching me the principles of hard work and survival in a world he distrusted. He had a fearful perspective of people and their motives. He shared those suspicions with me, often saying things like, no one else will really love you except your family. People cannot be trusted. We are the only ones here for you. Mm. Between the two presentations of my parents, I immaturely concluded that my security, worth, and value depended on me being nice. Don't create waves, trust my family, be pleasing, work hard, and then work harder, be fearful, don't fail, don't upset mother, be helpful, don't complain, even if you are hurt, be tough, excel in all of your, excel in all you do, protect and defend the family name no matter what. I live by these conclusions rigidly. Most of my childhood days I spent alone playing by myself and roaming my desert playground. I could usually be found interacting with the goats in their pen, milking them, riding them. I liked being alone. I felt safe with my animals. I did not have much adult supervision as my father worked full time and my mother appeared overwhelmed with many tasks and duties. Now, this is the part where Jody Hildebrand is going to talk about some of the traumatic things that has happened to her. So just a little warning about that. But I do have some questions about some things and I'll talk with you guys through it. I felt empowered to take care of myself, which I did proudly. However, wandering around myself placed me in harm's way when the 15 year old neighborhood decided to essay me throughout the ages of two to five years old. Um, I think a lot of people are also wondering on Reddit as well, like what is a two year old doing out and about on their own? But then again, this was like back in the day, maybe it was common. Cause like when I grew up, I mean, I was... I don't know. I was like seven or eight years old and I was home alone taking care of my two siblings. But two years old, that's that's pretty young um, to be out and about doing your own thing outside in the neighborhood without family supervision. Um, I don't know. You guys tell me. Um, Jody Hildebrandt was born in what, like the 60s, I think? Late 60s, maybe? Those experiences encased me in confusion, isolation and fear. So much so that I conveniently forgot about them until I was in my early 20s. Because of my misplaced obedience and desire to be good, I was silent and never told a soul. As a child, I never spoke about these abuses and all the accompanying lies and manipulations. I simply concluded that I needed to be better, the best, always helpful and kind. I felt a drive to be strictly agreeable and never disappoint or complain. I was locked into the illusion that I'm now bad. So as somehow I can try to be a good and this is how I'm going to do it. I became the perfect child. Unfortunately, the emotional temperature in our home was numb, so no one noticed anything abnormal. 
Even though my little world had been introduced to abhorrent, vile, lustful evil, I placed my focus on performance, acquisition, accomplishment, service, and hard work. I felt that I could somehow earn some of my worth back because no feelings were allowed to be shared. It was a horrible situation for me. The secrets that I held were locked away because of my emotional backlash I received from how my parents were raised. So my parental conclusions were, if I were good enough, obedient enough, hardworking enough, happy enough, I'd be good enough again. And that was my model for survival. It never panned out and I was never enough. You know, I think a lot of people have gone through that and have feel this. Like when I see people on court TV, you know, it's like, it's kind of easy to discredit them as being real humans, you know, cause like you look at them, you're like, oh, these guys are monsters. But you got to remember that sometimes these people, well, I mean, these people do go through like real human emotional things too. So like to see Jody talk about this, I'm like, oh, I forget. She, she is like a human or was a human at some point. Um, anyways, sadly though, I was perfect in my unbendable motto. I was assaulted again, this time by a boy from a placement program who my parents invited into our home to live with us. He was 16 years old and I was seven when the abuse began. It ended when I was nine years old. All my fears, beliefs, and conclusions that I had reached about my worthlessness were confirmed. Again, emphasizing there was no way back to worth or enoughness for me. I was bad, period. There was an invisible backdrop that permeated my life. Every choice I made, every feeling I felt, every precept I had all went through this portal of self-hatred and condemnation. How does a child of nine years old move forward with these filthy images in her mind? How can she, naive to the world evil around her, reconcile, reconcile these events? Easy, she forgets. And that's what I did. That was my brilliant way of living out of the remainder of my childhood years. I vowed not to make anyone upset with me to keep myself safe and unnoticed. Now, Jody Hildebrandt says that she essentially suppressed all these horrible memories of her childhood and that it wasn't awoken until years later when she was in her early 20s and she was trying to go to this um, religious camp thing, but they told her that she couldn't go because there was something inside her that needed to be unlocked or something and they needed to, I don't know, she needed to work that out before she can go to this camp thing. So let's talk about that portion right here. A few months after I turned 21, I was preparing to serve a mission for my church and my facade was questioned for the first time in my life. I had a history of migraine headaches since my early teens and have been dismissively told they were because I was high strung. But this time, the people working with me were not going to ignore the gravity of the situation. I would be traveling outside the United States and the powers that wanted to, and the powers that be wanted assurance that my medical issue was fully under control. I never felt panic strike me as it did when I was questioned and prodded for answers. I've always been perfect never questioned about anything i was not to draw attention to myself yet as i perceived it all eyes were on me and my physical limitations i was not in control and to me this threatened my demise i remember planning rehearsing and scheming how to avoid avert people's attention away from me i tried to appear as normal as i could desperately attempting to minimize what they seemed deem what they deemed as a significant medical issue i remember thinking to myself even though i didn't recall the previous assaults yet if they think my headaches are a significant issue, they don't know what significant issues are. So at this point, she is sent to multiple doctors and she's like, well, I'm just having migraines, but it seems like there are people in their church who are like, no, this is something deeper. We have to explore it. So she goes to several medical doctors and she says that they attempt to understand why she was experiencing migraines at such a young age. All the tests came back normal. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you choose to look at it, I was told my migraines were the results of emotional issues and that I would not be allowed to go on my mission if I did not uncover the root cause. I never felt anger well up inside me as I did in that moment. I thought, how dare they threaten me like this, tell me that there was something wrong with me and then not allow me to leave on this mission experience which I dreamt about for years. What was going on? Nothing makes sense. Nothing was working as always had in the past. I was terrified. I was told that I would need to see a therapist to discover the cause of my migraines. From my perspective, I was being asked to share my protected and hidden world with a complete stranger. My reaction was that old familiar voice of control screaming loudly, you're not going. You just need to try harder, not get headaches. I didn't really know back in the day um, that they were so open to therapy like this. If anything, I thought back in the day, maybe it was like, you know, oh, you're having migraines, you're having headaches, like tough luck, you know, deal with it. You know, here's some medication and all right, let's go to the church retreat. But, uh, or church retreat, church mission. I don't know if they're the same thing. I don't, are they used synonymously? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just like, okay, 
this is interesting. Like either they were really, you know, they really cared about her back in the day and they actually did take therapy very seriously, or maybe they wanted her to uncover something deep down. And I, I don't know. I'm always like very, I don't know. It's like mm, when I'm reading this, I'm kind of just approaching it with some apprehension, I guess. Like, I, I don't know if the motive of the people that were around her was really trying to help her or maybe it was something else, but I don't know. With a feeling of terror that logic could explain, I went to his office and prepared to give him the right answer. So this is her going to the therapist. Um, I wonder if it's like a church appointed uh, therapist or it's just like, mm. Little did I expect that he would see right through my obstinance and fear and zero in on my denial and positive, protective posture, sorry, protective posture. Three hours later, I came out with the burden of memory so heavy upon my shoulders that no one else could describe its weight. One of shock, fear, confusion, hopelessness, worthlessness, and panic that at least in my conscious mind, I never experienced before. I've never experienced before. Never before in my life did I wish death for death did I wish for death's door so benevolently open wide and swallow me up. I recall feeling intensity of pain and vividness of thoughts about my childhood that I'd shut up before. While I had spent the first two and a half hours attempt to manipulate, control, and distract this kind man, he was perceptive and did not allow me to duck and dodge his questions. The last 30 minutes of my invisible shield cracked and I was left with horrid memories, smells, images thousands of interactions with one of my perpetrators i couldn't escape the truth any longer um adam is like one of jody hildebrand's victims and he went through a lot with jody hildebrand essentially him and his wife um decide to see jody hildebrand just you know for, just for marital issue i mean i don't think they were even having marital issues it was more like just getting therapy together and as they were getting therapy together and they were being separate in like the women's group and the men's group um he believed that jody hildebrand started planting things into his wife's mind into thinking that he, Adam, was doing these horrible things behind the scene, um, being really creepy towards their newborn child, um, that Adam was like a sex addict and all this stuff. And Adam is like, I'm, I'm not, like, I'm not any of these things. And so I don't know if it's just Jodie Hilderbrandt. Um, you know, maybe she went through something where people were putting thoughts into her mind and she believed it. And she's like, oh my God, like I'm open to this whole new world. And maybe that's what she was doing into, you know, to her future clients. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just looking into it more than it really is, but I just want to share you guys my thought process when I'm reading this, okay? The last 30 minutes, my invisible shield cracked and I was left with horrid memories. Oh, I read that already. I remember looking across the room, shaking with emotions. I had no words for us, fears. Tears fell from this compassionate man's eyes. I was struggling to even breathe. I sat in silence and intermittent tears came to my eyes, yet never fell. What was this? What did this mean? Was this real? And then also, I was thinking that maybe this is how her, maybe she had like a hatred towards men. Maybe it all stemmed from her childhood, um, having bad occurrences with, you know, and like that would make sense to me, right? Just remember hearing stories about how a lot of the times, it was the husbands being separated from their wife. And it's not just being separate. Like, oh, let's take like a couple weeks break, a couple days break. But it was like, no, we're doing like months. We're doing like even years. Like when you, when I, when I read other portions of this book, um, she literally brags about how she separated this couple for two years so they can work on themselves. And then for them to be reunited again, two years, like two, that's a long time. This experience was a catalyst for my journey to find answers to heal my own wounds. And once I became a therapist to heal the wounds of others. During my journey to healing, I was not the traditional patient. I was curious and somewhat suspicious of the professionals I worked with. I resisted their attempts to diagnose my behavior, knowing intuitively that these labels were not components to my healing. As I participated in their interventions, I was inadvertently enabled to stay sick. Because of my trauma, I was allowed to not be responsible for my thoughts and feelings. And I was permitted and at times even encouraged to blame and hold resentments, which I could feel dug deeper, steeper, inescapable prison for my soul. After years of bumbling around and pretending to be in control, I went to God to find answers. I selfishly went for me. I wanted to be released from this literal hell in capital letters I was in and the constant and now clear memory for the acts that was inflicted to my innocent body and soul. For 20 years, I've been asking heaven for answers on behalf of myself and all those I work with. I spent tens of thousands of hours asking, studying, listening, and praying to see clearly how to apply principles of truth to human suffering and pain. As I have called upon heaven on behalf of myself and others, instructions have come to me like a slow drip. One true healing principle at a time. I believe I'm still engaged in the process of heavenly instruction. Oh my God, heavenly instruction. Oh, Jody Odebrandt. Heavenly instruction. Mm. That won't end until I'm no longer open to listening and applying his inspired invitations. I wonder if that's what she was telling all of her, like Ruby Frankie's children and to Ruby Franklin too. Like, oh, these are heavenly instructions. Like, uh... 
What I've learned in the language and I've given has not only healed my soul, it has offered healing to thousands of pain-stricken individuals. As a pro for answers, the cause of human suffering, I learn how similar we all are. All of us are searching for one thing, connection. Connection is the emotional and spiritual. And if you guys don't know, connection is the name of her um, business. Connections with like an X. Connection. Connection is the emotional and spiritual knowledge that you are seen, you are heard, you are known, you are loved, and most importantly, that you are divine. You are a child of God. In the sacred time I spent with people who are in vulnerable situations, I have learned spiritual truths, with a capital T, that cauterize and heal the human heart and soul. I have found this healing power to be consistent with the lives of everyone who chooses to live principles of truth, regardless of their past or present symptoms. So that was chapter one of Jodi Hildebrand's book. When it dives into her background history and what happened during the traumas that she felt, and then through therapy, um, she was able to discover herself. We'll discover the trauma that happened to her, and then from years of work, work on herself and become a therapist. In this portion, she talks about being disconnected by believing the lies of distortion that were all around her. And she noticed that there was a difference between how her family interacted with how her friend's family would interact. And you know, like, I don't know, if you guys ever grown up like, and you didn't really have the best family and your family kind of sucked, but then you would hang out at like your friend's house and their family was awesome, amazing. You're like, oh my God, please adopt me. I'd rather be here. Live, let me live with you. So, you know, she kind of went through that and let's read this portion here. I remember being at my best friend's house when I was a child. I remember spending time with Stacy and her family. I was constantly begging my mom to let me go over to their home because I felt so good over there. They even had an affection nickname for me, which made me feel like a part of the family. As I look back at it now, I was starving for connection and their family had it. It wasn't that they were perfect, never fought or disagreed. It was that when they did, they were always respectful and kind with each other. When I was in their home, I could feel the connection that I was so hungry for it and I loved it. Though I did not have the words to describe what was happening at the time. I remember feeling seen, cared for, and loved, and all of which are components of connection that were missing in my childhood home. So she uses the word connection a lot. And I just want to say that the things that she talked about this family, it doesn't mention anything about starvation, punishment, doesn't mention about binding kids, hog tying. So I don't I don't I don't know what happened what like what happened to her. There are many times when I would be over playing and her mom would say, Jody, it's so good to have you come over and play with Stacy. We love you. Or her mom would simply ask, do you girls want anything to eat? My friend would look at me for a response. However, I was in so much fear and distortion that I did not ask there for anything. I couldn't acknowledge my own needs, wants, or desires. My friend would say, yeah, mom, can we have a sandwich? And her mom would happily reply, you bet, girls. And off to the kitchen, she'd go to make it for us. Unbelievable. That was not the world that I was living in, and it felt so good. Connection was healing. I remember one hot summer afternoon when Stacy ran to the family room where her father sat. She crawled up in his lap and nestled in the face in, her, in his neck. He embraced her and stroked her hair and back. My instinct was to feel scared about all that affection being shown in broad daylight. He asked us questions about what we were doing and if we were having fun. She pulled her face away and responded happily, yes, we're going swimming now. She jumped off in his lap and ran past me and her father smiled and winked at me and called out, have fun girls. These experiences still echoed in my mind. I remember how good I felt witnessing them, even though I still felt that I was not a part of them. Now that I know that although my own trauma has impeded my ability to connect, I was still experiencing it vicariously through my friend and her parents. The invitation to connect was extended to me as well, but I was not able to accept it because it felt confusing and scared me, and I did not have the emotional skills to engage with it. I was too busy living in the world of fear, self-neglect, and distortion to be vulnerable. However, I could feel the power of love, truth, and connection inviting me to engage and felt safe. I, like I said, like there, it's not like Stacy was being, Stacy was able to get sandwiches. Her mom went over there and fetched her sandwiches and made them for her in a very loving way. So why would she ever think starving kids was, <laughs> was a thing? Okay, Jody. Hold on a second. It says made in the USA, Las Vegas, December 27, 2023. I literally ordered this like a couple of days after that, I think. Wait, is someone just printing Jody Odebrand's book on demand? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Now we're in the foundation principles of connection. And she shares a story about ex-husband and wife disputing and they had to go to court and fight over things. And I wonder if this is one of Jody's many clients that she had or if this is specifically about Adam. The example says... I remember a story of a woman who was going through a horrific divorce. Her ex-husband was full of rage and spiteful venom towards her and vowed to make her life as uncomfortable as possible. 
He went to court and demanded he have copies of her journals. He knew she was an avid record keeper and he was looking for anything that would humiliate her or support her case, his case against her. She was devastated. One day, she said in my office, she received notice that the judge had granted her ex-husband a request and ordered that all of her private thoughts, feelings, and history be turned over to the eyes of the court. He expressed that the worst of it, she expressed that the worst of it would be that her ex-husband and his vindict vindictive attorney would have access to all of her vulnerable words and emotions. She was in shock. Now, because I remember, I'm trying to remember parts of Adam's story. Um, I think it was he demanded the email communications between his wife and Jody, but I don't know if it was also like journals as well. Do you guys remember that? All right, if you guys do, uh, comment down below. Because I just wonder if there's, I feel like there's some portions of this book where she does mention um, Adam in it and the lawsuit that she had to go through and her getting her license taken away. Oh, this part was interesting. She actually talks about Elizabeth Smart in her book. Now, Elizabeth Smart was abducted from her home and she was, a, I think she was, was it more than 10 years that she was held captive for? Oh, no, it was, oh, it was nine, nine months. Oh, why did I think it was more than that? Maybe I'm getting Elizabeth Smart mixed up with someone else. But she talks about Elizabeth Smart and she tries to tie it to connection. Let's see what she has to say. A more current example and one that gained national and international attention is the story of Elizabeth Smart. At the age of 14, she was abducted from her home in Salt Lake City, Utah by Brian David Mitchell and his wife, Wanda Barzee, and held captive for nine months. She was rescued by authorities in Sandy, Utah, and now works as an activist and advocate for missing persons. Elizabeth has written her story in the book entitled, Where There's Hope. She shares her healing process and how she has perceived her past in truth and made peace with it. She too had an incredible adversity and made, and per her report, has little time in therapy. Yet she's been able to practice principles of truth to reframe her distortions, manage her trauma, and create connection. What kind of distortions was Elizabeth Smart having? She doesn't really define that. These two people have publicly shared their painful experiences, and each one has chosen to hold their experiences in truth, captivating a worldwide audience. Oh, I think she also talked about another experience as well. Um. We'll skip over that one, I guess. How did they do it? How did they find peace and freedom after such soul-wrecking abuses? The answer is connection. Whether your story is one of trauma or distress at the hands of the others or of yours in the making, whether you've been working the professional to rid your soul of pain or you feel like your life is going along fairly smoothly and without much drama, all of us are affected by distortion and therefore live with some degree of disconnection. I thought this was interesting. She's got a portion where it says... Um, openness. And she writes, I am transparent and accessible. I share my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors with others. I desire for others to share with me. I do not keep secrets. Really, Jody. Mm. I do not manipulate. Really, Jody. I do not fear what others think. Yeah, I could believe. Well, do I believe that? Yeah, I could, maybe yeah, I could believe. Well, actually, no, because she was keeping everything a secret. I don't know. I could, maybe. I am boundaried. Boundaried? Like I got boundaries? Maybe that's what it means. I am forthcoming with my thoughts and feelings. Okay. Now we're in the subsection of understanding. And I wonder if this is the part where she also brings up Adam as well. Example. I remember being on the other side of someone's understanding. I was working with the attorney as a result of being accused of something I have not done. I was devastated by the allegations and blatant lies that were being told about me, my actions, and more importantly, my character. I don't know if Jody Hildebrand had other lawsuits going on, um, because the one that we know about is the one with Adam, but maybe there were others that were kind of hush-hush. For months, my attorney played a dual role on my behalf as he sat with me physically. Oh, I wonder if it's the same attorney that she has now. Hmm. As he sat with me physically and emotionally and listened to the reality of the story and the inevitable pain I was experiencing as a result of a person's deliberate desire to attack and harm me. He validated me and asked me curious questions and was sincerely interested in how this case was affecting me. It was a generous gift from his heart. Now, this is the part that's under empathy. I can't imagine her having a lot of empathy. Um, <laughs> but let's see what she has to say about empathy. I feel deeply about the emotional experiences of myself and others. Example, my chosen career path has offered me the sacred opportunity to sit with people and hear their journeys. 
and everyone has one. I sit for hours and listen to their stories of pain, such as wayward children affecting parents and siblings, others being affected by someone's choice to act selfishly, and random acts of tragedy that no one is culpable for. I feel deeply as I listen closely to their words and ask questions about their meaning so I can best understand their feelings and validate them with having, without having to agree if I see things differently. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. I can't imagine her just kind of just like sitting there nodding her head. She seems like she would be like a very forceful person from what we've heard from other uh, victims. And so far from the victims that we heard from, I mean, aside from Ruby Frankie and her kids, or well, if you want to even count Ruby Frankie as a victim. But anyways, her niece, Jesse Hodebrand and Adam. And if you guys haven't heard about their stories, um, they did go on the Mormon Stories podcast. Although I don't know if Adam's story is back up yet. I know he was ha they were having some issues with that story. Um, they were they were asked to take it down, but maybe it's up now. Oh, this is a story about her clients that were having marital issues and she got them to separate from each other for two years, which I thought was wild. Let me see what she says. Let me share a story of a husband and wife where safety and trust were obliterated and then rebuilt upon the internal principles of honesty, responsibility and humility. This is a story of horrid lies, lust and numbness. After 29 years of marriage, Raquel walked in on her husband and another woman in their bedroom. This was not where her pain began. Rather, it was where her years of pain were vindicated. Raquel had felt something, had felt something was off with their relationship for their entire marriage, but because of her own self-denigrating distortions, she was unable to identify why she felt crazy all those years and at this moment. When I met the couple, they were ready to divorce, each for different reasons. She had built up an animated support system of many men and women willing to demonize and vilify her husband, which only gave her temporary satisfaction. He agreed with her accusations that he was not worthy of much as a result of this horrific, lifelong choices, most of which she was still unaware of. As her advocate, I was shocked by the peripheral narrative and sincerely curious as to how they were going to piece this relationship back together and what each of their motives were for doing so. After hearing two hours worth of detail, two hours, that's it? Two hours, that's not enough. After hearing two hours worth of details from both sides, it was eminently clear to me that they need to physically, after you talked to them for two hours? No, I feel like two hours is nothing. It was eminently clear to me that they needed to physically take space from each other so they did not continue to batter and abuse themselves and the other. I wonder if it's like emotional, probably emotional, right? The space would offer them the opportunity to independently see their own choices, perceptions, and emotions and be responsible for all of them. As long as they were living in the same space, the abuse on both sides would continue. They both agreed and that day he found another place to reside for a time. So we have another example of her splitting up the husband and the wife and making the man live in a different area. Every day they each called their men and women's group. Oh, we did hear about the separate men's and women's group. Uh, work with their sponsors, educated themselves on the principle of truth with a capitalized T, listen to educational podcasts, I wonder if they're her podcasts, and practice the precepts for their own personal responsibility. They learned about truth with a capital T and distortion, control, surrender, what each one was and was not responsible for, how to create and hold boundaries, how to express vulnerability and validation, how to truly and thoroughly repent and forgive, and many other characteristics that only invite any wounded soul back to the place of peace and freedom. They realized this was not a marriage issue rather than an individual one. Fast forward two years, well, no, no, actually, fast forward two plus years, and each spouse was now ready to interact with their partner for the first time. Oh my God. From a place of rigorous and personal responsibility from their own thoughts. You know, I think it's a good idea for people to take a break for a little bit, but two years, two years is a long time. <laughs> oh God, same reaction as the beginning of the video. That's a long time. They both were fully immersed in their own process of repenting and cleaning up what they both were responsible for. Um, This just seems like there's a lot of shame going on. I, I don't think she mentioned shame in this book. Um or doesn't really specifically focus on it. Maybe she did. But I feel like the root of all of this is like shame, 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 shame. You have distortions and you should feel shame for it. But she doesn't really mention it here. Seems like that was like the common theme with um, Jessie Hildebrandt, her niece, and with Adam as well. Um, one of the clients that she had um, given therapy to. As they met, it was the same two people physically, yet their spirits were completely different. 
They continue to say to each other, you are all so familiar to me, yet I don't know you at all. They both are so, I mean, yeah, because you haven't seen each other for two years. They both are so humble, honest, and responsible for their own perceptions, feelings, and reactions, or inactions. And when they became triggered, they would ask for space and call and receive validation from the men and women who had been nurturing them back to truth for months. Both partners chose to be incredibly safe and every day continue to practice the principles of honesty, responsibility, and humility to create trust. Oh no, 10 years later, they're still together. Okay, well, <laughs> maybe it worked for them. <laughs> or I don't know. Now that they found out that Jody Hildebrandt is arrested, potentially seeking a lot of prison time, maybe they're like, you know what? Jody Hildebrandt's stuff was BS. Why are we together? Why, why are we doing this? Let's break up. Empathic. Let's see what she has to say about this. Although your physical body is not naturally attuned to the skill of the empathy, your spirit is an expert. Little children, because of their relationship with truth, are naturally empathic. Empathy is the willingness to be vulnerable and validating, primarily within yourself, secondary with others. Being empathic means being connected intimately with experiences, feelings, and pain of self and others. I seriously doubt she's able to connect with the pain of others. Your soul delights in engaging in vulnerability and naturally emphasizes as you choose truth. Mm. 76. All right, we're going to skip lots of pages. Oh, I think I heard that Jody Hildebrandt was selling her home. Is that correct? Hold on. Because she actually has a passage, uh, a chapter about her trying to sell her house. And she was very offended about the offer she was getting and how she's being lowballed. Jody Hildebrandt. I think her home is like on sale right now. Utah YouTuber, therapist, Jody Hildebrandt's multi million dollar home put up for sale. Roughly one week after Jody Hildebrand pleaded guilty, her 10,000 10, plus square foot home, oh, that's, that's a huge lot, um, is now put up on sale. What is it listed as? 5.3 million. What? That house is worth What? I thought she was like out in the middle of nowhere. I thought it would have been like a cheap house. Like, I don't know. You know how in like the middle of nowhere you have like these huge houses? And it's like, yeah, it's like 400K. It's like, oh, psh. Jeez, okay, I I, I kind of want to look through the, oh, that's, oh, that's, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty. She's got a pool, fire pit thing. What, what is this? Oh, oh, is this a safe room that they were talking about? Okay, gotcha. That was incorrect, by the way. There were no children found in the safe room. Oh, hello. Let's let's go back to the passage about her uh, talking about selling her home. And she was very angry that she got lowballed. Not that I'm saying that you guys should go lowball her, but um, I wonder what kind of offer she's getting and if it's like pissing her off. I remember when I learned to choose to not take things personally. Years ago, I was selling my home. I needed to sell whoop, it quickly and make some money. But because of the housing market, I was going to be grateful if I broke even. I felt vulnerable. For several months, no one looked at it. I was surprised because I had kept it in fantastic condition and felt like it was reasonably priced. That's what every person thinks, okay? One person showed interest, but he wanted a lower price that reflected what he felt were disadvantages to the home. I reacted poorly, gratefully not in front of him. I was offended, upset, and insulted by how inconsiderate he was by being being by disregarding the home's amenities as I saw them. My realtor was helpful because she took the personal out of it for me. She validated me and helped me feel. She validated me and then helped me see that I was making all sorts of assumptions around his motives. I chose to realize that this negotiation wasn't personal. I was able to objectively consider the facts of the market, the home, the timeline, and my budget. I made an effort to perceive my motives as well as his in truth with a capital T, and chose not to be offended and go into distortion. I was able to get a place where I had compassion for both of us and I let go of the makeup stories I was telling myself about him and what he was doing to me. Maybe like so far would I agree, um, trying to take things personally, especially when you're selling things. People are just trying to get things at a good deal, good price and yeah. Oh, I actually wanna go back to a chapter that I thought was kind of weird slash interesting. Um, I know people had a lot of theories about maybe Jodie Hildebrand is a lesbian, like a closet lesbian perhaps. And I do want to say that when I was reading through this book, she does talk about a lot of like her girlfriend relationships. Um, I'll take that for however you want. Maybe you could read the book yourself and see what you think. But there's this one part that I thought was kind of interesting. I'm trying to find it right now. Oh, okay. I found this part right here. Let me share another example of me discovering my disconnection. 
I live a life where I felt fear much of the time and through my disconnection, I brought into, I bought into the distortion, lie in parentheses, that I was responsible for other people's feelings. I am meeting someone and really liking her. She and I appeared to be cut from the same cloth. I understood and seen and so did she, and we quickly became friends. I remember feeling scared to share this new relationship with my other friends. See, that's why I don't understand. Like, why would you be scared to share a new relationship with your other friends if it's just like a platonic relationship? Um, I, 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 I kind of thought it was kind of like weird slash interesting. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. I did not want anyone to feel jealous of the time and attention I was spending with her. So I kept her hidden for the rest of my life. Isn't that kind of, isn't that kind of weird? I would do things with her on certain days and times that would not conflict with other relationships because I truly believe that my friends would be angry at me for replacing them or not loving them as much. The distortion of those thoughts is powerful, yet that is where uh, what I honestly believe. I was terrified that my friends would ask where I was during the times I was with her and I did not want to be placed in a situation where I had to tell them the truth. So I did all my power to keep the two relationships separate. One day, what I feared most actually happened. I was talking on the phone with one of my friends and she asked where I had been at a particular time. I immediately knew where I had been as I was with the other friend I didn't want her to know about. As I paused to think of the answer, I knew I did not want to lie to her because I truly cared about her, yet I feared she was going to be angry with me. My objective in life was making sure no one was ever upset with me, so the thought of this friend being hurt by me was terrifying. I took a deep breath and told her, I was with a friend of mine and we were hanging out. She said, who? Because she knew all of my friends. I was choking on saying her name because I did not want to face what was to come. I said her name quickly and then began to explain my choices. I told my friend that I met her a few weeks back and that we were doing some things together. I remember closing my eyes, waiting for a reaction, knowing her hurt and anger was coming at me. Instead, I heard my friend say to me in a delighted tone, Jody, that's so awesome that you have another friend you can go and do things with. I'm so happy for you. You need a good people in your life and I'm glad that you feel safe with her. What? I thought. No anger, no yelling, no shaming, no tears, no accusations. I immediately began crying on the phone as I confessed the last few weeks of concealing my whereabouts. The gratitude that she expressed for me having another friend in my life and her compassion were amazing to me. So, I mean, it could just be innocuous, um, but I just thought it was kind of interesting and I wanted to share with you guys. Um, not like it's like a concrete answer or anything to, you know, some of the people's thoughts on the internet, but I, you know, like I said, I just thought it was interesting. All right, going back to towards the end of the book. That was in the beginning of the book, so I forgot all about that. In the last chapter of her book, she talks about how... Her daughter essentially has cut her out of her life. Um, I don't know if it's still an strange relationship, but at least at the end of this book, uh, it was still strange. So she doesn't go into much detail about it, but let's uh, let's read it. I was a single mother at the age of 26 after having been married for over two years. Just two years? I did not marry to get divorced, and yet I found myself alone in a busy world of responsibilities such as rent due dates demanding school assignments, children's needs, and a car that was on its last leg with no foreseeable way to cover repairs. I wonder if maybe they got married because she was pregnant twice and they're like, hey, we need to get married, but then it just didn't work out, maybe. I look back now and can still feel the overwhelming weight of those moments when I did not know how I was going to make it through. Inside of this world, I had an infant son and a two-year-old daughter who were the loves and motivators of my life. The three of us did everything together. I had little money, only enough for the basics, and therefore I would take my children to most activities and commitments. It was a tough most of the time as I had many experiences when one or both children would begin crying, yelling, refusing to move, or getting angry and making a scene. As I completed graduate school and my children were a little bit more mature, I had more time to do different things with them, such as biking, ATV riding, RVing, boating, traveling to different parts of the country and the world. We also spent a considerable amount of time working together. I had a strong work ethic instilled in me as a child and I knew that teaching my children to appreciate the immediate and long-term outcomes of gratification, of hard work, would support them later in life. The outcome of all of our time and interaction together was a relationship of vulnerability, love, truth, and connection. As my daughter began her teenage year, she spent as many teenagers do, more time with friends, yet these friends did not uphold similar values as I did. Well, I mean, of course not, they're like teenagers. Where I had once been the cool mom that she was excited to introduce to her friends, now in her eyes, I became a drag. Not in the know and overly cautious of too many things. If I could sum it up from my perspective, she was spending the time with the people who made choices in distortion rather than truth, or maybe they're just doing teenager things. 
As a result, I began to notice her anger at my interpretations of her choices and she would react from a place of control, whereas previously she had not. Distortion is a really easy choice to make because it requires no consciousness of thought or consequences. Imagine like just going through your teenage thing and then having one of your parents constantly telling you, you're living in distortion. This is distortion. This is not you. Ugh. The outcomes are usually pleasurable, most of which Im supply immediate gratification, translating into, I get what I want, which then reinforces the next choice in distortion, and the cycle continues. I could tell I was losing her to a world of money, flashy things, friends who were still quite young and unaware. Exactly, they were young and unaware. Social media and a hyper focus on her physical presentation. I mean, how are you guys like in high school? I mean, even though I was like on the nerdy side, but like I cared about looks, I cared. Social media, I mean, we had like Zango back in the day. I cared about that. MySpace, you know, I care about money, flashy things. Um, I also play, I also care about playing video games and stuff too. But um, I mean, this is just like normal teenage stuff from what I'm reading. Two months before she was ready to complete her junior year of high school, she announced that she was going to move in with her father because it was too difficult to live with me. She left on a Sunday afternoon. I was confused. I was really confused. I went into major optional pain and blamed myself for hours, which turned to days, which turned to years for the reasons and the issues she gave for wanting to leave. Every time I thought about what she had told me, I just can't live with you anymore. I turned into evidence of how bad I was as a mother. I thought once she left that I would see her on the weekends, but she refused to talk to me. See, this is this is deeper. This is more than just Jody Hildebrand not understanding her teenager, not letting her, I don't know, hang out with her friends, you know, do some social media stuff. Like this is some deep rooted shit. The fact that like the daughter doesn't even want to talk to her. Um, and I don't know what the relationship was like with the father. If the father was like, maybe they had like 50, 50 shared custody, or it seems like maybe Jody Hildebrand raised them all her on her own. Actually, I don't want to make that assumption. They could have had 50, 50 custody. Um, she wasn't very specific when it came to that, but I feel like there's a lot of in here that Jody Hildebrand is just leaving out. I thought once she left that I would see her on the weekends, but she refused to talk with me, see me or interact with me at all. It's been 10 years. And she's still in a space where she is not wanting any contact. <sighs> Something. Something. Initially, this experience completely caught me off guard. Did it? And I chose to see myself as a victim, trying to control what I did or did not do to make her leave, what I did or did not give her, what I did or did not teach her, and so on. Every time I thought of her, it forced me to look deeply at myself and why this was happening. For months, I scoured every interaction I had with her and wondered if I would have done this or changed that or said this or said that, then maybe she would not have left. I put myself through this emotional torture full of what ifs. Yet the outcome was always the same. She was gone and unwilling to see or interact. I, <coughs> excuse me. I wonder if there's any interviews with Jody Hildebrand's daughter. Um, Actually, we can let's look that up. The pain of a child turning from the truth from love. Ugh. The pain of a child turning from truth, capitalized truth. Whose truth, Jody? Your truth? Because she's making it seem like there's only one truth. There are multiple versions of truth, okay? Depending on the perspective. The pain of the child turning from capitalized T truths, from love, from connection is the type of pain that words are scarce to describe. As months turn into years, I was willing to humble myself and insert truth into this experience. Through the help of my own loving, truthful support system, I've been able to reframe from my end what the reality was repent for my own distortions, receive forgiveness from a loving God for the choices I made as a parent. I have been able to separate myself from my daughter's choices and accept her in the truth right where she is. This acceptance means I don't make up stories about her perceptions or motivations, which allows me to connect with her instead of control her in my mind. Hmm. I now have the skills to truly love her, which means I don't want anything from her. And I accept the life she is living exactly what she wants and chooses. Yes, I do battle internally and waffle at times to use all of my skills, yet I remind myself that I want her health and happiness. I have to let go of the illusion of her being in my life and an extension to complete me or make me feel worthy as a mom, or send me a message saying that I am enough. I am centered all by myself, which allows me to be grateful for the 16 beautiful years I was able to be with her and interact with her. I am thankful, blessed to be the mother of a beautiful daughter. I mean, it could be that... Maybe the daughter was overreacting and she is just being a brat. But I don't believe that. I, I just don't. Um, cutting your parent off, one that raised you for more than 10 years, leaving at the age of 16, like, there, I don't know, there must have been some stuff going on that she is just not mentioning. But 
Love is never about force or coercion, nor does it involve any form of fear, control, or deception. At the beginning of my experience with my daughter, I was not loving her. I was in full of fear of what her leaving meant about me as a mother, as her mother, as a woman. The answers that surfaced were full of distortion, which invited me to more distortion and control. I became depressed, anxious, and full of desire to be a better mother for my son since I had screwed up my daughter so badly. I was a control maniac for a time, and as time passed, I realized that no amount of self-loathing or cleaning the house perfectly again was going to bring her back. I truly began learning about love, truth with a capital T, and connection. And this is where she ends her book, pretty much. This is a, this is a chapter, what is it called? Love? Connection is love. <laughs> so I'm assuming she didn't have any connection with her daughter. And then it goes about about the author, uh, where she's just kind of selling her courses, her classes, her over 100 free podcasts. I wonder the podcast that she was saying that her clients were listening to were just her podcast. Um, her being the founder and president of Connections. Is Ruby Frankie in here? I don't think I say Ruby Frankie. Uh, we have some testimonies from all of her clients. Read what people are saying about Connections Classroom. <laughs> I mean, since I technically didn't read this whole thing, can I... I'm returning it. We're returning it. We are returning it because there's no way in hell I'm going to donate this and get this in the hands of anyone else out there. And also, I don't like burning books. You know, I don't like throwing away books. It feels weird, even though it's her book. <laughs> Return. Okay, so I want to see if Jody Hoja Brandt, daughter. Oh, wait a second. I don't know if I remember correctly. Did Jesse Holderbrand? Did she say that? Because I remember they asked like, oh, you know, are you still close with your family? And I think she said she's not close with her family. But maybe did she mention that she was still in communication with Jody Hodebrand's daughter? Or was that a different family member? Oh, God, I feel like I don't know. I, I, I don't even know what clip this even came from. You guys remember? I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah, I thought it'd be kind of interesting if her, if her daughter ever like spoke out um, in public or anything like that. See, this Reddit post says Jody had a divorce in 1999. Rumor she's been divorced five times, but that's not confirmed. Two children. Anyone know about the relationship between her and her kids? Jody's fine with cutting people off, warning the truth, so I wouldn't be surprised if she cut off her kids. Nope, it's the other way around. It's very interesting to me to see Jody talk about her experience with her daughter and how she admits at the end of the book that she screwed up her daughter. But yeah, look at what she's done to Ruby Frankie's kids. And who knows how many other kids out there, how many other adults out there. So you would think at the end of the book that she learned her lesson from messing up her own kid. But here she is. I mean, look at what she's in prison for. So again, Jody Hildebrandt is having her sentencing in February and we'll definitely be streaming that live. Well, I don't know if that's gonna be a live stream. It might just be one of those things where the footage will come out afterwards. But guys, um... Hope you guys enjoyed this video and I, you know, I like reading. So there's other books that I wanted to read as well <laughs> that I, <laughs> that you guys were like, Ugh, Corey, you don't read that. Ugh, don't waste your time with that. But I, I mean, there was one with Wendy Adelson. She wrote like a true crime sort of book thing. Um, Stephanie Hill or sorry, not Stephanie Hill. I keep calling her Stephanie Hill. Becky Hill. Her book is off the shelf because of plagiarism. So we ain't reading her book unless someone has it and wants to mail it to me. And then who else we got there? There's another book that I wanted to read. Did Donna Adelson write a book too? I don't know. I just, I kind of want to read it. Kind of interested. And yeah, I don't know. You guys, you guys have any other recommendations on what you want me to read? Anything you want to check out? Feel free. But uh, thank you so much for watching this video. Join the Discord. If you haven't already, have your notifications on. In my Discord, we do have a true crime section, so feel free to post things about that. But there's also a general forum discussions of other topics as well. So feel free to join. And yeah, thank you so much. And I will see you guys probably sometime this week. I think we're going to be doing um, a lot of Adelson stuff. So have a good one. Bye. And remember, guys, you are not enough. I mean, no, you are not not enough. Stupid title. <laughs>